When you want to create a Google Form, you're going to start out in Google Drive. On the left-hand side of your screen, choose New, and you'll see the types of documents that you can create. Forms is not listed on this initial drop-down, so go to More and then choose Google Forms. Now, here, you'll see that it says Untitled Form for the title of the form, but also the title of this form itself, the whole document, the file name, is named up at the top left. So I'm going to go ahead and change the file name up here to Student Submissions. Notice that it changed the name of the form down here on the form itself. Now, we're in the editing version of the form, so this is not exactly what people are going to see, but this is how we're going to go about editing and creating our form. Now, if I wanted to change this name for what the people see, if I want it different than the file name, I can go and change this student submissions right here that's highlighted in pink at the moment, and that won't change the file name. If I wanted to change the file name, I'd have to go up to the top to do that. Now, sometimes you might want to add a form description, and the form description would be something that the viewers of the form can see, and it would just describe maybe the instructions or give any background information that you want the viewers of the form to see. The next thing that you need to do is add the questions that you want the form respondents to fill out. So for this form, I'm having students turn in or submitting work. So the first thing I want to do is I want to collect my students' names. So I'm going to type in for my first question, first name. Now this question here is a multiple choice question. I don't want this to be multiple choice. I want to change this to a different type of question. And when I click on multiple choice, I can see all the different types of questions that are available. There's short answer and paragraph. The difference between the two is just the size of space that is available for students or form respondents to fill out their answer. Then we have multiple choice, check boxes where they can choose more than one answer, or they can choose from a drop down list. There is also linear scale and multiple choice grid and then people can enter in the date or time. Now one thing to note is that whenever someone fills out a form and submits it, it a timestamp is collected. Now that may be enough for you, but maybe you want people to choose a date for something, and so that's why you would use date and time in your form. For first name, I'm going to choose short answer, and now my student will fill in their first name. And there are some other options here. Down at the bottom, I can duplicate or delete a question. But this one here, required, is important. I want to make sure my students actually fill out their name and don't forget that box. So I'm going to check the required question box. Now I want my next question to be last name. So I'm just going to duplicate this question by clicking right here. And when I duplicate a question, it makes an exact copy, but it keeps all of the different settings. So it kept it as a short answer and it kept it as required. Now I can just go in and edit this so it's for the last name. The next type of question that I want to ask is for the class period. So over on the right hand side is where I can add a question. So if I click on the plus, now I can type in my period and I have my options here. So I can do first period to add another option. I'm going to click add option and do two, do three, etc. Now for class periods, I'm going to list all the periods that I offer, but in other multiple choice type questions, you may want students to be able to answer something that maybe isn't in the list of choices. So if you wanted something else, you can choose add other, and then if it's when they're filling out the form, if it's not one of those options, they can check the box for other and type in their specific response. Now, I do want this a required question as well. Now, something else that you can do with a multiple choice question that's pretty cool is if you go down to the bottom right to the three dots, there is a place for you to shuffle option order. So if this was a quiz, the answer choices could be shuffled each time a student fills out a form. But I can also choose go to section based on answer. This is really cool if you want to do something like a choose your own adventure type thing or if you want to just have like a branched form. So for example, if a student chooses first period, it will go to a separate section or a separate page in the form that's just specific to first period. If they choose second period, it would go to a totally separate 
page on the form that had something specific to second period. This is a really cool way to have students kind of self-quiz themselves. So if you had a question and they chose question or answer number one, and that was incorrect, it can bring them to a page that could reteach them about the topic. Um, so it's a really fun option. But I don't actually want this to be a multiple choice question. And the reason for that is sometimes in a form, when you have a multiple choice question, what ends up happening is all the numbers are on top of each other and it takes up kind of a big chunk of space. So I'm gonna change my multiple choice question to a drop down question. So that's gonna take up a little less space on the form itself. Now the next question that I wanna ask is for students to submit their URL or to submit their work. So I'm gonna click on the plus to add a question. And this question is going to be for a URL, and I'm gonna change it from multiple choice to a short answer question. And short answer gives them a place where they can write in text. I do want this to be a required question. And something else that I wanna do is I wanna make sure that my students actually enter in a full URL. I don't want them to forget the .com at the end. And so there's a way that you can validate the data so when they're entering in their URL, if it's not an actual URL, maybe they forgot the .com at the end, it won't let them submit the form. So to do that, you're going to click on the three dots again, but choose data validation. Now here for data validation, it popped up some extra wording. Um, the URL is not a number, it's actually text. So I'm going to click on that and change it to text. And then where it says contains, I can choose URL. So now, if it's not a URL, it won't let them submit the form. Right here to the right, it says custom error text. This is where you can give a little hint to students of if they did something wrong, what they need to fix. So for my custom error text, I'm gonna say, please be sure to enter a full URL. The next thing that I want to do is sometimes when students are turning in URLs or websites, if it is a Google Doc, they may forget to share that document. So I want to give them a reminder. So something you can do with any type of question you ask is you can have hint text. To do that, you're going to go to the three dots at the bottom and you're going to show the hint text. And right here you have a place where you can give a prompt to students when they're trying to answer the question. All right, so now the last question that I want is I want my students to just title the document or give me a description of the document. So I'm gonna add one more question by clicking on the plus. And for this one, I want this to be either a short answer or a paragraph. Sometimes I might instruct students to just give me a title. Sometimes I might want more information. So I'm gonna give them a paragraph to have a little bit more space in case that's needed. Now, the next thing I want to do is require that question. Now, if for any reason I want to change the order of my questions, when I click on a question, you can see that it has these two little bars that pop up. So I can click on that and drag and move my questions into different order if I needed to. There are some other things that you can add in addition to the questions. On the right hand side, we clicked on the plus sign to add a question. But below that, if we chose the two T's, we can add a title and a description. We could also add an image. So if we wanted a picture that could be um, for a question that you might ask your students about, or it could be a picture that's a logo, um, there's another place you could add pictures later, but this would be adding pictures kind of mixed into your form. Another thing you can do is add a YouTube video. So if you click on this link, it will give you a spot to add in a video. And this is great if you are flipping your classroom and you wanna have students watch a video about content or material, and then you could have questions afterwards related to that video. It's also a great way if you were doing the choose your own adventure style where you can have students answer a question and if they get it wrong, they can go to a video that will help reteach them that material and then you can ask another question afterwards. The last thing you can do is add sections and this is adding in different areas. So now our student submissions is a section. We have this untitled section here with the questions. If I go down to the bottom 
and do you add a section, it will add a section after that. And so this is basically kind of like giving you different pages of your form. So people, if you have a really long form, they don't see a really long form on one page, they see it split up into different pages. This also allows you to do the choose your own adventure style. So in your multiple choice, if you check the box that allow them to go to different sections based on their answer choices. And with the different sections, you can always duplicate sections, delete a section, or merge it with the section above. In the previous version of forms, you used to be able to change the theme. So you can change the picture, the color, the text, the font, the color of the font, all of those different things. Right now in the new version of Google Forms, you have a limited option of what you can change to customize your, the look of your form. Hopefully soon, you'll be able to customize it in the same ways that you did on the previous version. To change the color or the theme, you're gonna go to the color palette, which is up here on the right side of your screen. When you click on that, you have choices to choose different colors for your form. But you also have the option at the bottom right to upload your own image or choose from some images that Google already has created. So down here at the bottom, I can upload my own photo. I have created an um, image using Google Drawing that I would like to use. And here you can see that the image is actually too big for what can be displayed on the form. So I have to make it fit within this box. In the old version of Google Forms, you could use whatever size image you would like. So hopefully again in the future, this will be changed so that you can use the whole image. I don't like that this one's gonna be cropped off, so I'm gonna say cancel. But what I can also do, if I go back to the image, I can choose ones that Google has already created. So if I'm looking for different holiday themes or for different um, types of events, I can find that here. They also have some fun animated ones. So you can see here these, the candles on the birthday cake, the flames are moving as well as the sparkler on this one. Now, right now when I go to use one of these images, it's not actually going to be moving. And again, on the old version of forms, it was. So hopefully again, that will be changed soon. So right now you can see it's just a static image. It's not moving. If you would like to see what your form looks like live, you can click up on the eye up at the top right of your screen for the preview. This is now your live form. So you can fill this out and submit this form. One thing that you might notice up at the top right is that there's a little pencil icon to edit this form. Not everyone will see this pencil. The only people that will see this pencil and have access to actually edit the form itself is you as the owner of the form and any collaborators that you might share this form with to give them editing rights. So your general user, the person that you send this form to to have them fill it out and submit, will not see that pencil. Clicking on this pencil will just bring you back to the editing mode of this form. The next thing that you want to look at are the settings for your Google form. So if you go up to the gear at the top right, you'll get to the settings menu. Here, you can choose who can respond to your form. You have the option to have anyone within your Google Apps for Education domain or anyone in the world to fill out the form, if they have the link or access to the form, obviously. Um, if you leave it as your domain, you have two options here that you can choose. So you can automatically collect their Google Apps domain username, or you could also, or and you could also have students submit only one response, and that does require them to be logged in. Now, I, you would think that it would save you time to automatically collect their username, but I've run into problems with this. My students are not always great at logging out of the Chromebook, and so on the shared Chromebook, when the next student comes in, if it's already up on the internet when they open it up, they're not gonna sign in themselves, and so you won't get the correct username data automatically collected. So I generally don't automatically collect that response information. If I'm looking for my student's username or email, I have an actual space on the form for them to fill that out. Now, I also 
generally like to choose anyone can view this because again if students are not signed in with the right account uh, maybe they're signed in with their personal email they wouldn't be able to access the form and then I'd hear complaints that it's not working for me so I like to just open it up to anyone the next section here is for the confirmation page and the confirmation page allows you to write a message for the respondents after they press submit and the message could be something like thank you so much for filling out this form you could even have links to uh, websites. And so you can type in the link and it will be hyperlinked for you once they get to the end of their form. So maybe your students were watching a video or answering some questions um, after watching the flipped video and maybe they didn't do so well. So you could have a link to other resources that they can go to. Um, but you can't customize it based on the answers. This, confirmation goes to everyone who submits the form. The next section shows respondents a link to submit another response. Generally, I like to keep that on in case students are sharing devices. Um, they can submit multiple times. You can also allow students to be able to edit their response. Depending on what you're doing, that could be a really valuable resource. And the last one is to see a summary of responses. So. I wouldn't use this for a test, but maybe you want students when they're doing a lab, they're typing in their answers, they can see what other people have chosen. Next are our presentation options. So you can have a progress bar down at the bottom of the form page. If you are just using one section for the form, it's not worth having a progress bar because they can see their progress as they're going. But if you had multiple pages or multiple sections on your form, the progress bar would be a good indicator for the person filling out the form of how much farther they have to go. Something else that's cool here is to shuffle the question order. This will shuffle all of your questions on each of the sections. So if you were doing a quiz, you might want to shuffle the question order, but be careful because your name and period would be shuffled as well. To share your form with the respondents or with your students, whoever's gonna be filling out the form, you're gonna to wanna to go up to send. When you click on send, you're gonna have a pop-up that's gonna repeat some of the information that is in the settings. So you can choose who can respond to the form. So I'm gonna say anyone. And then you have the option to email them the form. And if you email it to them, you would type in the email address, the subject, and a message. And the form itself will be embedded in the email, which is really nice if it's, it will be simple for them to fill out. Now, you can also get a direct link to your form by clicking on the link, and then you can copy and paste this link. What's nice is that there's this little box to shorten the URL, so you have a nice short URL that you can use to send out to your respondents. The last thing that you can choose is you can get the embed code. So if you wanted to embed this form on a website, you can change the width or the height and copy and paste the embed code into your website or into your blog. You can also choose to share it with your um, Google+, Facebook, or Twitter accounts. Um, but one other thing that you can do, if I go back to email, down at the bottom of the screen, there is an option to add collaborators. And Collaborators would be if you want someone to be able to edit the form with you. So if you're using a Google Doc or Google Slides, you have the share button up at the top right. This is basically how you can share it to give someone else editing rights by choosing Add Collaborators. Be sure though when you add collaborators that you also give them editing rights to the spreadsheet that is created and we'll see the spreadsheet next. To see the responses of your students when they fill out the form, you're gonna go to responses right here in the editing version of the form. Now, you can see that I have entered in one response just to kind of test it out. Um, Melissa Hero, first period, and this is a sample link for the video, and I have a URL here. What this does is this kind of gives you a summary of your results, and it will even make graphs for you to display the different information. You might see some pie graphs, you might see some line graphs, but you'll also see text and other things entered. Now, this is great if you just want a quick visual for your students, but you may want a spreadsheet to be able to access those results. So if I click right here, 
it's going to create a spreadsheet for me that's going to have my responses and I can create a new spreadsheet and give it a name or I can choose an existing spreadsheet so I can make it a tab on a spreadsheet that I might already have created. I'm just going to leave it as create a new spreadsheet and you're going to see that a new tab opens with the spreadsheet that has my information. It has the timestamp of when I filled out the form. It has all of my information and here the link is actually clickable which is really nice. It wasn't clickable in the summary that we saw. I'm going to go back to our form to see the responses. You have two other options here. One of them is the more actions, the three dots on the right, and here you can choose the, to select the response destination, which was the destination um, that we created by creating the spreadsheet. You can unlink this form. So if you want to unlink the form from that spreadsheet, you would click here. Sometimes I've done that after one school year is over and I've unlinked it and then created a new response destination for the new school year to separate the the year's data. You can also download your responses in a CSV file if you want to open it up in something like Excel or if you want to be able to import it into a gradebook. And you can also delete responses. When you delete your responses, it deletes everything that's linked with the form. Another option that you have here is accepting responses. Right now it's green, so that means that when people go to my form, they will be able to fill it out. If for some reason you need to turn off the form because you used it as an order form and you're no longer accepting orders, or if it was for a quiz and the quiz is over, you don't want students to have access to it anymore, you can click on this and it says now it's not accepting any responses. And then it has a message for the respondents. The form student submissions is no longer accepting responses. Try contacting the owner. You can change that to have it say whatever you'd like it to say. So if we look at a preview of what the form now looks like, you can see that they get this message. The next option that you have on your form are these three dots that give you more actions to choose from. You can make a copy of this form so that you can use it again, but maybe change up the questions. You can move it to trash. You can get a pre-filled link, which is pretty cool. If you want to have the same form but have some of the information already filled out for some different groups, um, you can click there. To get more information about that, you can go to the Help Center. You can print the form and it gives you a pretty nice version if you, people need to fill it out by hand for some reason. You can also choose to add collaborators here. Um, one option was to do it in send and send an email to add collaborators, but you can add collaborators right here. You can go to the Help Center, report a problem, or take a tour. Now one thing to note is that when you do add collaborators, remember that you are also going to probably want to add them, give them editing rights to the spreadsheet, so you'll need to do this kind of twice. You'll add collaborators on the form, but then on the spreadsheet you're going to share it with your collaborators as well. So make sure you share both the spreadsheet as well as the form.